you know, the potential of the technology is so good that it changes the ethical question from do we have the right to do it to do we have the right to withhold it. The really scary thing about CRISPR in that environment, though, in the sense of how democratising it is, is if someone's thinking, I don't want to give myself big muscles, I want to make a really pathogenic bacterium. That really, really scares me. And gene editing will make that so much easier just because gene editing is so good at changing genomes. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you're listening to the Feedback Loop by Singularity. This week, my guest is British biologist Nessa Carey, who has researched and written extensively about the latest trends in molecular biology and biotechnology for several decades. This includes her 2011 book, The Epigenetics Revolution, and her more recent 2019 book, Hacking the Code of Life. In this episode, we lay some biological groundwork by first discussing the often misunderstood field of epigenetics, a process wherein our DNA changes how it's expressed constantly throughout our lifetimes, potentially to the point where we might even pass on genetic changes to our offspring. From there, we dive deeply into gene editing and CRISPR, discussing the current state of the art, what's possible and what isn't and how to use gene editing to heal disease and address ecological issues. We also discuss the existential threats that gene editing poses for both our species and our planet, how to therefore regulate this technology, and much more. Nessa's background in scientific communication truly shines in this conversation, as she provides some of the most succinct and easy-to-understand descriptions of these topics that I've ever come across. So if you're looking to get a good understanding of these topics, this is a great place to start. So without further ado, please welcome to the Feedback Loop, Nessa Carey. Well, if we can, I would like to start with epigenetics with you because I feel like it lays the groundwork for kind of a natural conversation around how genes can edit themselves even without our interference. However... Epigenetics to me feels like a concept like quantum physics that gets talked about in ways that undermine the science constantly and is very confusing and everyone has misconceptions. So could you just give us an overview and and, and take away some of the things that epigenetics isn't and tell us what it is? Okay, so epigenetics, one of the things that's really difficult with epigenetics is if you could you could ask six different epigenetic scientists to define epigenetics and you will get at least seven different descriptions. Um, so it's really not helped by the terminology. And I think of epigenetics as operating at two levels, I think. So one is the phenomena that you can see. So every time you see two things which have exactly the same DNA code, but those two things are phenotypically different from each other, so they differ in appearance or behaviour or anything like that, that's an example of an epigenetic phenomenon, which is a phenomenon where there is something else as well as genetics playing a role. Because the, the phrase epi just means at, on, in addition to, it's just a really old Greek word. So you have epigenetic phenomena, um, and those have been known about for decades. There's been lots of situations where you can see that two things must have the same DNA and yet they're different. And a great example would be if you look at yourself. Um, the cells in the retina of your eye, for example, have exactly the same cells, at, sorry, exactly the same DNA sequence as the cells lining the tubules in your kidneys. And yet they're completely different cell types. So something is happening in addition to the DNA. So for the decades, all we really had was this phenomenological description. Now what we have is a molecular explanation to some extent of how those things happen, how you can end up using the same DNA script to create different outcomes. So if you look at the molecular definition of epigenetics, and that's where it gets into terribly um, angels dancing on the head of a pin type debates between scientists, 
there is no one perfect description with which everyone agrees. But the way I would describe it is that you have a set of chemical modern modifications to DNA and the proteins that are associated with DNA. And those modifications can change gene expression. They can be passed on when a cell divides, but they don't change the sequence of the DNA. So I always think of them as being like post-it notes on a script. Is it fair to say that that script has parts of it that can be turned on and turned off? And that's what yeah. is really what we call the, the an epigenetic shift? Exactly. So what happens during development, for example, um, when you start with one cell formed from the egg and the sperm fusing, and then that divides into two and four and eight and 16, and you keep going until you've got trillions of cells. What happens is as those, as the embryo becomes increasingly differentiated, so instead of being one mass of cells that all look the same, you start seeing the development of the spinal cord and the placenta and all that sort of thing. Um, what you see is that epigenetic modifications are being established and if they're turning certain genes on or keeping certain genes repressed. And those are really important for how we maintain different cell types. So remember, I was saying that the cells in your retina look completely different from the cells in your kidney. So epigenetic modifications can be ways of switching genes off permanently so that I can on off switch. But there are certain epigenetic modifications which can act like a volume switch. Mm. So you can have genes which have the potential to be on and they might be on just a little bit or they might come on really highly in response, say, to an environmental stimulus. And again, that is really influenced by which epigenetic modifications get put on that DNA and its associated proteins or which ones get taken off. So it's both an on off switch and a volume switch. And it doesn't act in isolation. There's all sorts of other cellular systems as well, but it's a really important system. And as you alluded to, a lot of these shifts occur in response to environmental stimuli. Yeah. Is this something that is taking place constantly where pretty much everything we're doing at oh, any given moment? Absolutely. Is it, yeah. Absolutely. Um, because in some ways you can think of epigenetics as being the link between nature and nurture. It's how the environment and your genes communicate. And we're changing all the time because our environment is changing every second. Um, so sometimes I see people writing complete rubbish, um, real pseudoscience saying, you know, this compound or this food or this activity, it's terribly good for you or terribly bad for you because it changes your epigenetics. Everything changes your epigenetics. It's an incredibly dynamic system. The bits of epigenetics that are involved with the sort of volume control of your genes, they are much more dynamic. Mm. They are the ones that change much more easily in response to the environment. The changes that get established in early embryogenesis that result in you having different cells in your eyes from your kidneys, those are incredibly stable. Mm -hmm. And they only, those epigenetic changes probably only go wrong during cancer. Yeah. Speaking of that stability, what, what causes a shift then to be either a transient one that maybe just is, is fleetingly active versus one that becomes a long-term shift that tr almost permanently and definitely changes your, your DNA expression. It's to do with the kind of chemical modification that's added to our genome. So there's a very particular type that is added to DNA directly, and that's called methylation. It's just one carbon atom with three hydrogen atoms. And if you get a lot of that methylation uh, on a gene, it tends to switch it off. And that modification is incredibly stable. It doesn't fall off and it gets reproduced every time the cell divides. So those are really stable, but DNA is not a naked molecule in a cell. We think of it as, we picture it as the double helix and you always just see that sort of train, twisty train track. But actually DNA is wrapped up around proteins called histones. And you get lots of modifications to those histone proteins. And those are the ones that on the whole act as the on and off, uh, sorry, act as the volume switch. And they are chemically less stable. And they're also enzymatically less stable. So it's much easier for the chain, the cell to change those. And so those tend to be the ones that respond to the environment more vigorously. It's not an absolute, but that's the kind of basic situation. And is there a 
Well, I would say one of the things that seems to be the most complicated or maybe pseudoscientific aspects of this is what happens in terms of reproduction. So is what what causes something to be passed on versus not? Are the epigenetic shifts that occurs in one's life basically always passed on or not? Um, right. So the majority, so if you're a guy, um, you probably have sperm and those have particular epigenetic modifications on them, partly because that's how they end up being sperm. If you're a woman, and you, you're producing eggs, those have different modifications on them. And when the egg and the sperm fuse, they have to stop being an egg in the sperm and become something else. And so most of the epigenetic modifications get wiped away and then new ones get established. And so, and also the cells that produce sperm and the cells that produce egg are what we call very protected. So they tend not to um they tend to try and protect the eggs and the sperm from what's happening environmentally mm. so the majority of epigenetic modifications are lost during reproduction certainly in mammals but there are some that are retained and it's possible that that's where you can get some transmission of epigenetic information from parent to offspring however there is an awful lot of nonsense talked about this and ridiculous claims made. Me, I absolutely believe that epigenetic information can be passed on and that information may have changed in response to the environment. And I believe that because of all sorts of funky and mad experiments in things like water fleas and in mice and in a tiny microscopic worm and also in plants. So you see that happening. But that isn't the same as being able to prove it ever happens in humans. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because when we demonstrate that it happens in mice, I use the royal we, I've never demonstrated this, other people have demonstrated it. What you have is you take very genetically inbred mice and you keep them under really standardized conditions. And then you give them this huge stimulus. And then you see if that's had consequences for the next generation. And if so, if they were mediated through epigenetics. That's the complete opposite to what you see in humans. So humans, we're not genetically identical. We have incredibly difficult, uh, different environments from each other. Um, our environments are really, really noisy. So you can't on the whole just give one massive stimulus. So it is possible that this happens in humans. We will almost never be able to detect it, not in an individual. We can detect it potentially at a population level, mm. but you can't say, Fred's going to inherit an epigenetic or going to transmit an epigenetic trauma and Gemma isn't. It, it, it doesn't work like that. It's also not clear that um, it, it seems very unlikely that what happens is an epigenetic modification in the brain of a human gets passed on to their child directly and into the epigenetics of their brain. It's much more likely that what's actually happening is that we're not passing on the direct DNA or histone protein modification. That what seems to be happening is it's all to do with small little bits of RNA that also get carried over in the egg and the sperm, and they potentially set up a signaling cascade that results in the same epigenetics developing. But basically, if someone says to you, oh, we've, we're seeing transgenerational trauma through three families of drug addicts, and that's all epigenetic, it's like, yeah, it probably isn't. And right. you'll never prove that it was. So it's, it's an area that requires caution. It, it's created fantastically fun experiments. But in humans, most of what's important is happening to you during your lifetime. I wouldn't worry too much. Um, the, the example I always give is you absolutely, as a human, cannot say the reason why I am 140 pounds overweight is because my granddad ate three donuts. That's not how it works. It absolutely doesn't operate like a like a get out of jail free card. What we're doing during our own lifetimes is the important bit on the whole. Sure. Well, th this is a bit of a, a big sidestep, but one I think is a, an important one as we kind of look now into the technology side of things a bit. How do you think our relationship with technology then is impacting our our epigenetics? Because for me personally. One of the things I'm highly interested in is, is humans' maladaptive relationship with their environment. And it seems to me that we are, uh, 
bathing in a maladaptive world that would cause all kinds of epigenetic shifts. You know, I think of like the, um, the grasshopper and the locust, right? I don't know if you're familiar with that gregarious phase, but this radical change in behavior that just comes from being in a slightly different environment. Do you feel like technology is, is, is probably bringing a lot of epigenetic shifts to people's life by virtue of being such a um, different environment? Possibly. Um, it would it would make a lot of sense that epigenetically we change as our environment changes. Mm -hmm. What it's much harder to say is whether those are maladaptive changes or not. You know, they're just changes. Um, and it's it's really tempting to fall into the way of thinking of these environmental changes are bad things and our adaptations to them are bad things. But it's really important to think about what we mean by good and bad in this circumstance. Um, so, you know, every generation has always thought that, for example, children are turning into idiots because of the new technology to which they're exposed. I'm sure when somebody first invented the hoop and the stick, you know, we see those pictures of Victorian kids rolling a hoop with a stick. I bet you there was somewhere going, well, that's it. Children are doomed now. They're just going to spend their lives rolling a hoop with a stick, you know? Um, and I think we have to be very, very careful. We don't really know what is good for us and what is bad for us sometimes and what we mean by that. So, you know, I'm of an age where I think children should be reading books and they should be going outside a lot um, because that's what I did. Um, and I'm not sure I'm anyone's ideal role model. <laughs> and it's very tempting to go, they shouldn't be inside playing computer games all the time. And they probably shouldn't. But you probably shouldn't be doing anything to extremes. So it's... It's really, you have to be really careful if you start saying things like, aha, all those children playing computer games, we've seen they have the following epigenetic changes. Well, maybe they do, but maybe it's a change saying, oh, this person's now a bit smarter because their hand-eye coordination is really good. You know, it, it's very, very difficult to do. I, on the other hand, I do think we live in crazy times, certainly those of us in Western societies where we're inactive, we eat really crap food, we eat far too much of it, etc. Um, I think there are things which are very, very bad for us as populations. But I wouldn't want to say that all the negative consequences of those are being mediated by epigenetics. There's an awful lot of other things happening as well. And it could be our epigenetic systems are changing because they're going, hold on, let's just try and minimize the damage to this. And we don't know enough to understand if these changes are maladaptive or actually quite protective. <clears throat> well, in this brings us to a question I was going to maybe save for a bit later, but I think feels really important now. Bearing that uh, ignorance in mind, what are we doing going in and messing with genes? You know, we, if, if, we, <laughs> if, we, if we don't understand what's uh, maladaptive or not, it feels like we're playing God in a, at a time period where we don't even know what God can do or, you know, what, uh, okay. you know what I mean? It, it depends what we mean by messing with genes. So sure. when someone's epigenetics is changing, the one thing you're not doing is basically changing their gene sequence. So the epigenetic modifications may change, but that's just like putting different post-it notes on your plate. You're still, you're still delivering Arthur Miller's script. Um, so we're not, epigenetically, we don't change genes. And also another thing we need to consider is that you can't control what epigenetic changes happen. So again, I see pseudoscience where it's like, oh, if you take this supplement, you will change the epigenetics on the genes involved in. And it's like, no, I think that's very unlikely. We can't actually direct it that way. Where we can change genes, of course, is with the technology of gene, of gene editing. So there we can change genes. Um, and it's a really interesting field and it's an ethically incredibly fraught field. I'm never convinced by um, the concerns around we shouldn't be playing God because that's what we've always done. If you take the idea of playing God as interfering with what is natural, we shouldn't have vaccines, we shouldn't have antibiotics, etc. You know, we've always done it. But there's something about DNA and our genomes and our gene sequences, even though we don't know them most of the time. For some reason, we feel incredibly proprietary about, and I'm really interested in why we do. Mm -hmm. We somehow feel that that is messing with the basic essence of us. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why we feel that. I mean, if you think about, say, 70 years ago, Nobody knew the structure of DNA. Go 100 years ago, nobody even knew DNA existed, or certainly not that it was the genetic material. And yet we've become incredibly possessive about it, which I find quite interesting culturally. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, for me personally, building on that idea, I feel like part of it's just that pattern idea, right? We we feel like kind of informational patterns, and and when yeah. you really boil down to it, that DNA is our pattern. Um, I would say it's our starting point. DNA is necessary but not sufficient. I don't think you'll ever explain all of human complexity just by genetics and our DNA sequences. Um, you know, nobody knows why Einstein was super smart, and I don't think we'll ever work that out even by sequencing bits of his DNA, which I'm sure are lying around in various places. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know that humans are an incredibly plastic species. We're very good at adapting to our environment, um, not necessarily, not through gene changes, just through being adaptive. Um, and so that hap that happens no matter what your genetic sequence. So of, of course, there are some people who are dealt a really, really bad genetic hand. So they're built, they're dealt a mutation that will have a devastating impact on their life course. But even if you look at people with exactly the same genetic mutation, they're not the same person. They're still very different people. If you look at identical twins, um, you know, they, they begin to differ epigenetically. So even though they have exactly the same DNA script, they don't have exactly the same risk of certain diseases, for example. So you know, a DNA, yes, it's important that your DNA sequence is not technical term would be absolutely stuffed. But um, that's just your baseline. Then it's all the nature, uh, sorry, then it's all the nurture stuff. Then it's your environment that pretty much governs your life outcomes. It's not necessarily your genetics. Well, and speaking of, I guess, the the nurture side of things, I think we could put gene editing in that bucket. Let, let's maybe get specific about gene editing. Where where, where are we with gene editing these days and, and what really are we doing? You know, are we doing things like causing intentional epigenetic shifts with things like CRISPR? Are we doing other things? What are we CRISPR doing? CRISPR has is now being adaptive so it can actually um, create precise epigenetic changes at mm. a particular gene. And that was a technology that was something we were never able to do before. So it was always really difficult to investigate hypotheses that said, I think this epigenetic change at this gene causes this consequence. That was very difficult to do because you couldn't all go in and interfere with the epigenetic modifications. And now the technology is becoming established to do that, though it's still very early wow. days. Um, and that's, that's kind of mind bending, really. Um, and it will ultimately, um, put a stop to lots of the arguments about is epigenetics important or isn't it? Um, alternatively, we can just wait for some people to die or retire, et cetera, and put a stop to the arguments that way as well, which is the way science really progresses most of the time. <laughs> um, gene editing is, and CRISPR, CRISPR gene editing, whichever we want to call it, is an extraordinarily powerful technique, but most of its applications are going to be in changing genetic sequences, not in changing epigenetic sequences. Um, and it's, it's a technique which is magnificent and the best thing about it is it's so easy and the worst thing about it is it's so easy because you cannot control the technology that pretty much anyone can use. And that's a really scary situation to be in in some ways. Me, I'm, I'm quite positive. I think the benefits will far outweigh the negatives, but that's just me liking science and being a geek. Yeah. Well, one thing that is another... Uh conflation or maybe pseudoscientific aspect of this is what is possible with with technologies like CRISPR, right? Is this something that we can do in a living adult or is this something that has to happen in vitro before germination? You know, when when okay. can we actually come in and toy with the, the You can do both in theory, but the consequences are different. Um, so CRISPR is already being used as a drug, essentially. Um, as a medical intervention in adult humans. It's being used in people who have particular genetic conditions. So the one in which it's most advanced is in sickle cell disease and its related condition, thalassemia. And the use of the technology there is beautifully elegant. So people with sickle cell disease have a mutation, which means their bone marrow produces red blood cells, which are not functioning properly. Mm. And that's caused by a mutation. The reason why I think the sickle cell approach is so elegant is if you're trying a new way of creating treatments for a condition, 
you always have that risk of, you know, you give a patient something and what if it goes horribly wrong? So with CRISPR, what they did with sickle cell disease patients is to take some bone marrow out of the patients, then use CRISPR to, co to correct the defect in the hemoglobin gene that creates sickle cell disease. And then they could test the cells to make sure the correction had gone well and the cells were behaving well. And then they put them back into the patient. Hmm. So they never injected the patients with CRISPR itself. They injected them with their corrected cells, which then repopulated the bone marrow and produced normal red blood cells. And sickle cell disease is something for which we have had no effective treatment and no drugs basically for 40 or 50 years. Um, there was nothing to offer patients who were going through crippling sickle cell crises every month, having to be hospitalized for long periods of time every month. The patients who were in the clinical trials for CRISPR as a sickle cell cure, not just as a treatment, it's actually a cure. We're seeing patients who have now gone over a year mm. and who have not had a single sickle cell crisis, have not needed to go into hospital. Their quality of life is absolutely transformed. Um, and that is pretty astonishing. It will probably, the latest suggestion is that that will probably have a $2 million price tag if it gets all the way through to being licensed as a drug. But it will still be cheaper than treating patients with sickle cell crises every month. So, so in a situation like that, it has extraordinary potential. Those patients, they will be CRISPR'd um, because the CRISPR state change happens and then gets passed on to all the daughter cells in the bone marrow. <laughs> Excuse me. Hopefully they should have a very, very long period when they are essentially cured. Mm. What they won't do is pass on that CRISPR change to their offspring because it, that change hasn't been made in the reproductive cells. And that, that sort of use of CRISPR of treating patients with it and hopefully curing patients with it that, I think, is on the whole relatively uncontroversial as long as the benefits outweigh the risk, just like any um, <clears throat> any drug. It's not quite the same as any drug because once you've made the change, if you then decide that was a bad thing, the only thing you can do is go back and try and undo it, which is complicated, but yeah, it's, it's, it's still really, quite good. Really quickly, is sickle cell unique in that regard? Is, is there something about it that maybe makes it easier for this process that isn't applicable to a lot of other... Common the thing that's really good about sickle cell was the fact you could take the cells out of the body and treat them. Mm -hmm. So any disease, genetic disease, which is caused by a mutation in the cells that create blood cells, and that could be red blood cells or white blood cells. So some of the immunodeficiencies, for example, where there's a genetic defect in the cells, um, in theory, will be treatable mm. by a CRISPR approach. In theory, you could treat every genetic disease in an adult using CRISPR. The difficulty is not the CRISPR. The difficulty is getting the reagents of CRISPR, the bits that do the work and make the change. The difficulty is getting them into the right tissues to do the right change. So with the sickle cell disease, you take the bone marrow out. So that's fine because you know you're not going to be able to, you're not going to start changing the sequence in the brain and in the liver. It's just going to be in the bone marrow because you never put it into the patient. Probably after the blood disorders have been tackled with CRISPR, we'll start seeing it being used for disorders where the problem is in genes that are most active in the liver and have to operate in the liver. And the reason for that is you can inject the CRISPR stuff into a patient's bloodstream, it will go to the liver, and the liver's job is literally to go, what the hell is that? And the liver cells take up this foreign thing, and that's great, because now you've got your CRISPR where you want it in the liver. What's much more complicated is to do things like to deliver large amounts of CRISPR reagents to the skeletal muscles if you're trying to treat Duchenne muscular dystrophy or the brain if you're trying to treat Huntington's disease. It's much harder to get enough material to make the genetic changes in enough cells in those sorts of tissues. Um, the other place where we're already seeing CRISPR making an impact is in the eye, in genetic mm -hmm. disorders in the eye, because the eye is nice and small and you can inject stuff straight in. So that's where we'll see it. On the whole, there isn't that much controversy about using CRISPR for these kind of applications. Um, and Jennifer Dubner, who was one of the women who won the Nobel Prize for creating CRISPR, said you know, the potential of the technology is so good that it changes the ethical question from do we have the right to do it to do we have the right to withhold it, mm. you know, because it is potentially so good. What's much more controversial is to edit 
very early embryos where you're deliberately hoping that the change will happen in all the cells as that embryo develops and therefore you've created an individual who has a different dna sequence from what you expect them to have and they will pass on that change to their offspring mm. and so that is always going to be controversial and there's a lot more power there than in the adult right because at that stage you don't have to worry about not being able to get it to the right area because it goes to every cell it goes to every single cell so um it does bring its own technical problems because you know you're dealing with a tiny embryo in a dish um you it's not like the blood cells where you can go oh we'll take out you know a few hundred thousand of the ones we've grown in in the lab and we'll check that they're okay you know if you're dealing with an embryo that's only got say eight cells in it and you've put the crispr reagents in how do you check that all eight cells have got exactly the right change and also that they haven't got any what are called off target effects that you've only changed the gene you want to change that's incredibly challenging to do on tiny embryos so the risk is greater um and therefore there has to be a much more pressing need to do it there and it, at the moment in every well-regulated state it's illegal to do that mm -hmm. um you can't edit a human embryo and then re-implant that you and then implant that embryo into a woman it's, it's against the law pretty much everywhere um it yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah. So I, I was going to go a little sci-fi here, so maybe a weird <laughs> tangent, but this this makes me think a lot of people when they hear gene editing, they start talking about things like using senescent cells from squid or octopi or using, you know, chameleon like uh, uh -huh. cells like yeah. what what is possible in terms of the changes? How much can we really get in there and and even more more than just change what's there? Like, can you add other genes? Can you add things that just don't fit in? Yeah, our in theory, you can. Model? I mean, in theory, you could do that with the old technology of gene modification as well. But gene modification is just so inefficient compared mm -hmm. with gene editing. So, in theory, you could do that. Um, but genomes are extraordinarily complex. It's not just to do with the sequence of genomes, human genomes. They have to structure correctly and putting in big new genes in unexpected places, that's unlikely to end well. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't be allowed to do it, although I have to say right now, the idea of having chameleon genes is really, really appealing to me. I really like chameleons. Um, I think that kind of, or that sort of transhuman, where you're, but where you're doing a trans effect, i.e. taking from another species, mm -hmm. um, I think is, um, it's theoretically possible, but it's in the real kind of mad scientist realm, I think. The chances of anyone ever being allowed to do that are vanishingly remote. Yeah. That, of course, doesn't mean some lunatic might not do it, and they would, but they would have to do it in a very poorly regulated environment. And then, of course, it, it's almost um, environments which are very poorly regulated to do really mad experiments in and mad human interventions are often not the environments in which the technology exists to do what you want to do. So the CRISPR was relatively easy, but getting those early embryos, that's very difficult. Then maintaining them while you do the CRISPR is really difficult. And then making sure they're healthy enough to put into a woman. Um, the chances of finding an environment, a country where you have all the infrastructure that you need, while with a complete lack of regulation, that's actually quite tricky. So it could happen, but it's, you know, it, it, it's certainly not the intention. <laughs> Right. And that, but that's more formal, right? I think one of the concerns with CRISPR for a lot of people is that you can get your garage hackers, the people who just set up a CRISPR studio in their garage. You absolutely can. The guy's already done this. Um, yeah, he injected CRISPR reagents that can be used in, um, in, he injected CRISPR reagents to basically manipulate the way that muscle grows and the way mm. that muscle stops growing. Um, and he injected himself in his bicep and he filmed it. And sadly, absolutely nothing happened. And I say sadly because I think it would have been amazingly funny if he'd ended up with like one huge bicep. Yeah, so one half of him is like Popeye and the other yeah. is still this geeky guy. Nothing happened, which doesn't tell us CRISPR doesn't work. It just says 
probably didn't do the experiment well. It is the big problem, though, um, is that this technology is cheap. The reagents are pretty readily available. You can't control it. This is not like enriched uranium and you look for who's got the ultra centrifuges and you stop them using it. You know, this is pretty basic stuff. I have no problem with people deciding to CRISPR themselves if they really insist they want to do so. I mean, you know, God forbid we ever interfere with the potential of a human to make a complete aegis of themselves and to do something really dumb. You know, that seems to be the right for which we all fight is that we should all be allowed to be as ridiculously dumb as possible. I've no problem with people doing that. I have a vague problem if they make themselves really ill and then the healthcare system has to pick up their costs, you know. I have a bit of a problem with that, but there you go. People ride motorbikes, people smoke. We still expect them to be treated in hospitals. The really scary thing about CRISPR in that environment, though, in the sense of how democratizing it is, is if someone's thinking, I don't want to give myself big muscles. I want to make a really pathogenic bacterium mm -hmm. or I want to make a really pathogenic virus. In theory, that would be really easy to do. The thing that would stand between somebody doing that and then then causing a massive global pandemic or even a localized outbreak of a really dreadful disease would simply be the fact that it's relatively easy to do the CRISPR. It's really quite hard to grow up large quantities of really dangerous bacteria and viruses in your garage. Yeah, that requires sophisticated equipment. It requires um, a level of containment so you don't accidentally kill yourself or infect yourself. But that is a concern. Um, that that is one of, to me, the biggest risks of CRISPR. I'm much more concerned about that than about genetically enhanced humans, however we want to think of that. Have you seen much lately in terms of how this kind of artificial intelligence boom we're experiencing is impacting things? Is there an empowerment of the CRISPR tool or other gene technologies because of artificial intelligence that you see coming down the line? So we could use artificial intelligence to make it much easier to predict which off target effects we would see with CRISPR. So to start getting together much better sets on data of if you use this CRISPR sequence, there is a chance that not only will it bind to the gene you're interested in, but it will bind to these other regions of the genome. And these are the ones you should be looking at as well. So AI will probably be useful for that. The other reason why AI will be useful is it's getting much, much better at identifying various bits of the genome which all contribute to complex diseases. So the diseases which are not 100% genetic or are not caused by one mutation. If you look at something like multiple sclerosis um, or lots of chronic diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, etc., schizophrenia, they're caused by a complex interaction between the environment and the genome. But it's not that there's one area of gene that is really badly disrupted. It's that there are lots of genes that are all contributing, say, 5% mm. of increased risk. AI is getting much better at identifying what the combination of genes is that gives an increased risk. And then you can test that hypothesis by changing those with CRISPR. So that's where I see the AI stuff coming in its most immediate application. I'd love to speculate about something wilder, but it just all moves too fast and I haven't got a clue. So I yeah. just look at the short term and the bit I can think about. I mean, it makes sense to me. The, we, we've been talking about humans predominantly thus far, but one of the things I'm worried about, you know, uh, with our company, a lot of things we try mm -hmm. to tackle are things like energy and food production and, and some of these UN sustainable development mm -hmm. goals yeah. that are facing yeah. the world. What what are we looking at in terms of maybe making things like drought resistant strains for food or, or energy producing algae, things like this that might contribute to other aspects of the world that aren't human specific? Yeah, that's a great question. And CRISPR has enormous potential in that field. I think, again, because I'm just a cheerful kind of a person, I, on the whole, think it has potential to make a really big difference. So if we look at agriculture, agriculture is one of the major drivers of greenhouse gas emissions and also loss of biodiversity because agriculture uses up such a huge amount of land and degrades land as well, the way that we do agriculture at the moment. So CRISPR has already been used, for example, to create rice, which are more tolerant to salt. Mm. And that's really important because intensive agriculture creates saltier soil. 
and rice soil, uh, rice yields start to drop. And so farmers then have to start growing in new areas. And so you lose more and more natural land. So CRISPR yeah, really, really quickly was used to create rice, which can tolerate much higher levels of salt and have increased yield of rice, which is great. Um, and that was a great technical triumph because rice have a really complicated genome and it blah, 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 you know, great, great technical triumph. So one way of looking at it is that is fantastic because now we can keep growing rice on this agricultural land that previously we would have had to go, okay, we're going to use more land. So that's great because we should be able to start decreasing the amount of land that we use for agriculture if you apply that principle to lots of crops. Except, let's imagine you're a farmer in a fairly poor, poor part of the world and your income and your ability to send your children to school or to get the medicines is dependent on the yield that you can grow of rice or whatever mm. crop you're interested in. If you're then presented with a rice variety that can tolerate higher levels of salt, you're probably not going to think, oh, that's great. I can just keep growing on the same bit I've been growing on. You're going to think I can keep growing on that bit. Plus, I can start growing on that bit down at the edge near the mangrove swamps, which was previously too salty. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody could, ban could blame a farmer for doing that. You know, he or she needs to support their children. But the minute they can expand their acreage into areas that previously were the bits nobody was interested in, then you have another loss of biodiversity. Yeah. Um, so it's a real, it's a potentially brilliant breakthrough technology, but it's going to be how we use it that matters. Um, but one of the things that is very good about CRISPR, though, is because you can make precise changes in crops, we actually maintain genetic diversity rather than losing it. So if you look at current plant breeding solutions, which are very old fashioned and are based on breeding, you know, crossing varieties, you often end up losing a lot of diversity to create the variety that you want, the characteristics that you want. With CRISPR, you could take, say, eight different wheat strains, all of which are adapted to different environments. And you could do the same CRISPR change in each one just to produce the one effect that you wanted. And you maintain all that other diversity. Mm. So it's... It's a very, very complex juggling act that we have here. In the same way that we talked about a potential almost like gain of function from a garage hacker issue uh -huh. in the human circumstance, do we then, like you were saying there, run into a potential issue with a runaway ecological issue? Could we could we create a strain of like an invasive species or something that, that starts to ravage a landscape? Absolutely. Um, I think what's the biggest... The thing that I am most uncomfortable about gene editing and what it can deliver is when you combine gene editing with something called gene drive. And gene drive is um, a way in which you can increase how quickly a particular characteristic spreads in a population. So normally, if um, easy way of describing it, if you have a fly and it's got a red gene and a yellow gene, Right, a red version and a yellow version of the same gene. I'm just using those to visualize it. When it passes on its DNA, it will half its offspring will have the red gene and half will have the yellow version of that gene. Yeah. A gene drive is a system, a genetic system that you can introduce into things like insects. And instead of 50% of the offspring having the red version and 50% inheriting the yellow version, you can find that you can create situations so that 75% inherit the red version and 25 the yellow version, and you can keep making it more and more extreme. So you get rid of particular versions. And there's a way that you can do this, which means what you actually cause is population collapse and wiping out of populations. So if you use gene editing to create these kinds of gene drives, that scares the life out of me. Because if you then release, say, mosquito populations, um, genetically edited, gene-driven mosquito populations, and they cause an absolute collapse and an irreversible collapse in mosquito populations in the wild. I don't think we're very good at predicting the consequences of something like that. You know, we we have had we've tried biological control a lot in the past, and sometimes it's worked really, really well. And other times we've done things like introduce cane toads to Australia and completely destroy 
destroy entire ecosystems. So the idea of irreversible interference with an ecosystem, I think is pretty appalling. That really, really scares me. And gene editing will make that so much easier just because gene editing is so good at changing genomes. Right. Well, all of this, uh, you know, it, a lot of people talk about AI, AI, and I think it's uh, profound, of course, but it, it feels like gene editing really has a chance to, to reshape the world in a way we've never imagined before. And this all begs the question, what are we doing in terms of legislation? How do we handle policy around this? Where are things right now? And maybe where should they be? Yeah, I think one of the difficulties is that we cannot have global regulation. There are very, it, it would be almost impossible. And in some ways, that, that's right, because if you look at, say, attitudes to what would be considered a serious condition, those will vary enormously between different countries, between different cultural groups, between different religious groups. So it's very difficult to get global moratoria on anything. Um, we do see that there are big drives to try to create ethical frameworks that at least will be recognized and observed by practitioners throughout the most advanced economies. And that hopefully that will also transmit into other less advanced economies. That's particularly the case when it comes to using gene editing in humans. Um, <clears throat> in the UK, we have the advantage that we've had for a long time, something called the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, which is very, very good at getting to grips with these kinds of questions and also regulating practice within the country. So I think in terms of what is acceptable in human populations, we'll start seeing consensus, at least in the countries that have the most advanced technological infrastructures. We will start to see more of that. I think it's going to be a bit harder in the world of crops and foodstuffs, and it's going to be harder in terms of pest control as well. Because, you know, I can sit here and I can say, well, I think it would be a terrible thing if we caused the collapse of the malaria, uh, the mosquito populations, because, you know, that could play havoc with ecosystems. Because I live in the east of England, we don't have a problem with malaria. Right. What if I were a parent in an area where malaria is endemic and maybe two of my children have already died? Yeah, I, I would not be quite so friendly towards the mosquitoes. And so it's, you know, this is going to require an awful lot of local and regional and national and international cooperation because everybody has different drivers and it, getting to sensible uses of this technology is not going to work well if those of us who have always been in the most privileged positions keep telling those people in the less privileged positions who would just like the affluence that we have what they should and shouldn't do. So it's it's going to be a tricky one, but I think that is true of almost every technology. Yeah, well, respecting your aforementioned sovereignty of the idiot, <laughs> how much how much regulation do you think we should then bring to the table? I mean, do you want to see this kind of be a little loose, or do you think we should get pretty rigid and and really kind of walk carefully? I think I think the problem with going really rigid in a and particularly with tight legislation at the moment, is that the technology is moving too fast. Mm. So if you you could put in place laws now that would actually turn out to be very counterproductive. And one of the examples you might want, might think is relevant, is the very different way that, say, America has dealt with stem cell research compared with Europe. And that has had implications for the research that can be carried out, it's had implications for the technological advancedness of the US and Europe in this sphere. And it's potentially not necessarily been helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so I suspect where we're going to end up will be in that situation of creating regulatory authorities who have the capacity to operate within parameters rather than having really strict legal frameworks in the same way that the FDA is empowered to do things. Um, so I think we will start seeing more and more of that kind of regulation coming in. 
I think most um, scientists working in the field would like a global moratorium at the moment on germline gene editing in humans. Um, but they don't necessarily want to see research in that stopping. Um, but I think you know, at the moment we have in the UK, for example, there's um, there have always been rules about how long you can continue to work on early embryos for. So you can't take them beyond a particular date. And I think we'll see more of that kind of thing happening. I think a global moratorium on germline editing right now, if it could be enforced, wouldn't be the worst thing ever. But um, it's a better or not you can enforce it. Right. That's always the hard part. Well, as we Indeed. talk about looking forward and, and we start to come to a close here as we reach the end of our time, what what are your thoughts looking forward? Are, are there promises or pitfalls that you're particularly interested in that, that you would like to bring to attention? I like the promise of the use of this in agriculture and the potential of this to really be one of the tools that we use to deal with the fact we're, you know, the planet's on fire and it has very little resilience left in it. You know, we're, we're, we have disrupted um, natural systems to an extent which is unsustainable. You know, that it, there's just no redundancy left in the systems. We are reaching tipping points. And having better ways of creating food with less of an environmental impact, that would be an excellent thing. But also one of the areas you touched on, can we use this to start creating better fuels from things like algae, et cetera? Can we use this to create strains of bacteria that can deal with the huge plastic wastes mm. problem? Can we use it to create strains that can extract rare metals so we don't start deep sea mining and destroying the only intact ecosystem that's still left to some degree. So I think it's really important for all of those things, but that's going to take enormous, it's going to take enormous effort and not just by the scientists. Mm. Um, the, this is like most science. It's the economic and social environment in which it works that makes it either good or bad. And we could use CRISPR for all sorts of really positive things, but if you still have trillions of dollars going into oil subsidies, it's not going to compete very well. Right. So, um, but on the other hand, it's much easier to do geeky experiments than to change people's attitudes and to change political and economic systems. So yay for CRISPR. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? That's the statement of the century, I would say. <laughs> any, uh, well, any closing thoughts, anything you'd like to talk about, anything you're working on these days that you'd like to promote or share? I would just say this is a topic that I think I would really like everyone to learn about and to educate about themselves because there are really big decisions to be made and we should all of us as citizens of whatever country we live in, we should all actually contribute to those discussions and we should contribute from an informed viewpoint, not from a knee-jerk reaction of certain types of science are bad. It's always the applications of the science and it's going to affect us all either directly or indirectly. So I think it's one of those things where we really should kind of take ownership of it.